patterns. Um, and this is an unrolled elevation of the full structure um, on the top. And you kind of see how on, on the west side, um, they point in one direction on the east side, they, they point in the other direction as it wraps around. Um, so it kind of speaks to the north and south uh, behaviors, migrational behaviors of the birds. Um, as with all of our projects, we, we kind of try to strive for completely integrated workflows um, from design to fabrication. So the algorithms we develop kind of output directly shop drawings, fabrication files um, to, to kind of streamline that process. And you'll see a lot, that's a kind of common thread in a lot of this work. Um, and these are just some recent shots. Um, I finally had the chance to visit this. Um, I hadn't been able to get up there because of the pandemic, um, but I was there a couple of weeks ago. So these are some recent photos, um, just kind of capturing the light coming through um, at different times of day. And you get a sense of, um, in many, many times a day, it's very subtle, but at, when the sun comes through at certain times, it, it creates this, these kind of immersive shadows. Um, and this is a grainy picture, but um, you know, viewing the, the football stadium beyond, as I mentioned before. Um, and some views from the outside of um, extending up above the, the, the spandrel glass as well. Um, the second floor piece, uh, Lines of Flight Human, is much larger. It's about 650 linear feet of um, pattern on glass. Very hard to draw. Um, this was a kind of interesting side note on the project, was developing ways to represent um, the design and kind of communicate to the client and the city, city council and so on in an effective way because the project is so long, but um, the kind of aspect ratio is so extreme of, of length to, to height. Um, so working a lot with animations and kind of panning, drawings, things like that. But essentially it extends um, several hundred feet on the new facade of the, the kind of internal Skyway corridor on the south side of the building and then continues on the, and then a Skyway structure which was existing. Um, this was not new construction. Um, uh, which connects to the adjacent um, Hennepin County building across the street. Um, and and the, the artwork is on both sides of the Skyway. Um, so again, just another picture from, from the south side of the building. Um, and this is a picture of the Skyway um, crossing, crossing the adjacent avenue. Um, the design for this project, as I mentioned, was focused on, on kind of visualizing, spatializing data um, of human migration to the land that's now known as Minnesota. We were very intentional in kind of taking a much kind of broader view of, of migration patterns over time. Um, we did use, we had access to a, a pretty detailed uh, census database of migration of different populations over time, which obviously only accounts for a very small slice of history, um, but it was useful in terms of um, kind of linking a data set um, to the graphic strategies that we developed. Um, the piece is essentially um, several dozen ribbons, um, which you see in these drawings, um, that weave together in and out of each other across the facade. Um, each ribbon is representative of a particular population, um, and each ribbon serves as a kind of timeline um, from, of, of that population's kind of um, arrival or, or immigration migration to, to the states, the land of Minnesota um, over time. So the, the bands become more intense and less intense um, in gradation in terms of the, the kind of line weight of the dashes. Um, and the, the, all of the bands kind of weave together in this basket-like um, form. Um, as you enter the public service building from the main lobby on the north side of the building, you, you walk on the second, you walk up to the second floor um, and along this kind of large public ramp, and you, you see the piece on the south side of the building. Um, and it, as I mentioned, it, it, it's, it extends from the new building onto the existing Skyway, which are very different architectural conditions. Um, but I think, um, you know, it's interesting how the piece kind of responds to, to both the rectangular module of the cur new curtain wall and then the truss logic of the, of the Skyway. Um, again, creating these kind of um, immersive shadows, um, is particularly in the morning and late afternoon as the sun comes in through the south. Um, these are just some, some more detail shots so you get a sense of the kind of, our, our approach, um, we, we, we work a lot with techniques that we call data spatialization, of, of trying to find ways to visualize and spatialize data that 
that um, kind of walk the line between literal representations and abstraction. Um, and so our interest is, is, is providing kind of data rich artworks that are not kind of immediately legible, like kind of in your face, but that, um, that do have a kind of logic um, behind them that's linked to, to real information. Um, and um, again, also interested in the kind of effects of in the material effects, the lighting effects that, that um, can emerge from, from these processes. Um, the here in this detail, you see um, again, these kind of ribbons that change in density, but the, the space between the ribbons um, is also a field of dashes that's kind of less in density. And you see these little dots at the end of the dashes. So this, this is um, uh, a moment where you see the, the kind of two algorithms um, overlapped with each other. One is, as I mentioned, the kind of data-driven um, migration algorithm overlaid with the, the bird safety parameters um, that I mentioned earlier, uh, which have to do with kind of minimum spacing of quarter inch dots, white dots um, to prevent birds from colliding with the glass. Um, and this comes from many, many kind of years of research and studies by scientists who studying the, be the behavior patterns of birds and like how, basically how to prevent them from, from thinking that, that the glass um, is a continuous space. Um, so that again is, is, is something I'm very interested in is kind of like melding algorithmic logics together um, or synthesizing them um, in new ways. Um, the other uh, project I wanted to show for my kind of design practice um, is a, another recent installation um, we did here in Palo Alto in California. Um, this was commissioned by the city of Palo Alto last year uh, for a one year, uh, they have a, a great program in the city of these kind of one year temporary installations uh, by artists and architects. Um, and this was commissioned, I guess, before the pandemic and realized during the pandemic and installed during the pandemic last year. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a sculptural installation in the plaza in front of City Hall in Palo Alto, which um, you probably know is a city south of um, San Francisco in Silicon Valley, um, adjacent to Stanford University. Um, and the piece itself was inspired, it's called Arbor, and it's inspired directly by the kind of um, history of Palo Alto as a city and their, the kind of city's identity, um, which Palo Alto in Spanish actually means um, tall tree. Um, and uh, to, I did not know this before doing the research for this project, but it actually refers to, there actually is El Palo Alto. Um, there is a tree called El Palo Alto in the city, not far from City Hall, um, which is a, a kind of medium tall uh, redwood. It's certainly not the tallest redwood um, I've seen, but it, it is still there. It's very celebrated um, and it kind of exists on a lot of the city's identities, um, graphics and so on. And so I was immediately kind of thinking about trees um, and ways that the artwork could engage with this identity, this history, but also let's say um, the trying to find a kind of, again, a kind of data-driven logic um, that could inform the artwork. Um, the city also was very interested. They had seen some of the earlier work and they were interested um, if an artist could kind of tap into their own data. They have, they have a very kind of robust database of public data um, for the city of Palo Alto and they were interested, could that become fodder for an artwork? Um, in starting to think about the project, I, I also looked a lot at kind of instruments of, um, of um, visualization and um, circular uh, displays of, of, of photography and imagery, um, things like zoetropes, um, uh, and cycloramas. This is the famous Gettysburg cyclorama in Pennsylvania, um, and ways that that spatial information um, in the round could be captured, kind of in a singular object or a singular device. Um, and and I was very interested in how that that sort of like how a device like that might take place in the in the plaza of City Hall. So the city's open access data portal, um, like I mentioned, has many. Um, many, many, many aspects to the database, but um, to my surprise that one of the, the databases they have is a catalog of every single tree 
in the city. Um, and this was this kind of blew my mind because I was just, just thinking about the labor um, of collecting this information <laughs> over time. Um, but it's a, it's a GPS kind of um, uh, encoded spatial database, map database with um, locating every tree geospatially, but also all sorts of information, including species, diameter, how many trunks it has, height, the canopy width, um, et cetera. Um, and, and I think it's almost 50,000 trees that exist in the public right of way. So it's not every single tree, it's, it's all of the trees in the public right of way, so street trees and parks and things like that. Um, so this became very interesting to me as a kind of mapping um, uh, exercise um, and quickly kind of bringing it into a parametric model um, and starting to understand this is just a map of dots of all the tree locations from the, the database. Um, starting to understand how, how the tree locations actually kind of generate an image of the city itself. Um, the, the outline of Palo Alto is very irregular and strange. Um, and this dot, this is a kind of blow up on the right, this dot refers to um, the location of City Hall. Um, this is downtown Palo Alto over here. Um, this is just kind of connecting City Hall with every tree in the city, all 40, 40 odd thousand of them. Um, and starting to understand how there might be a possibility for a kind of compass or a map located in the plaza um, to document all of these trees. Um, and again, looking kind of spatially, um, three dimensions of that map um, with, with notation related to height and canopy width and trunk width and, and so on. Um, so the piece itself is, is a, a, a 15 foot diameter circle circular installation um, made of vertical and horizontal ribs um, that serve as a, as a kind of compass um, mapping this database. And the on the left, you see the kind of um, diagram or didactic graphic that's um, located actually in the kind of middle of the installation on the site um, to orient visitors. Um, and essentially what how it, how it works is that the um, there are 100 and 20 ribs, vertical ribs in the structure, creating 120 kind of pie slices emanating from City Hall. And you see that in plan here. And each of those pie slices kind of captures the number, the quantity of trees and the type of trees within that pie slice. And that data is used to, to sculpt the relief patterns that are on the edge of every vertical rib. So it's, again, it's a very kind of abstract mapping project. Um, the um, the color also varies based on the quantity of trees um, in each slice, um, which is highly irregular because of the shape of the city, but I, I found that pretty interesting. Um, and these dots on the side also correspond to quantity of trees. So you kind of see, you know, towards the south from City Hall, there are areas with far more trees um, than towards the north. Um, on the right, you see a, a, a rendering of, of the project and plan. Um, and the piece itself um, was, is fabricated of laser cut um, 16 gauge steel that's powder coated um, and bent. Um, it has uh, flanges along the edge um, and small tabs that were bent by hand to assemble. Um, and uh, you can see kind of how, how it works. It's a fairly simple structure um, from very, very thin material. Um, so a lot of the prototyping that went into this was, was kind of trying to develop ways for to, to build structure, structural rigidity out of very thin um, and affordable uh, steel. Um, and these are just some, some images from the outside um, showing how the piece captures light. Um, it has an opening so you can enter in and kind of orient yourself. Um, and it's fun to see people kind of find their, where they live in the city on the map and then kind of locate the rib on the perimeter that refers to their part of the city. Um, again, this is, this is just a, an animated um, snapshot of the shop drawings and the fabrication files coming out of the digital model. Um, each rib is unique because of the data mapping, but also they slightly change in height as it moves across, as it moves around the, the structure. Um, and there were quarter inch steel base plates and a number of horizontal um, reinforcement ribs. Um, two different sizes, different heights. Um, that, and all of that was kind of factored into the, the parametric model as a way to link um, the, the form of the design with the, the corrugated edges, which again refers to the 
number of trees um, for each particular rib um, and the 2D fabrication files that would um, uh, be necessary to laser cut these in 2D. Um, the assembly, um, it, it's very similar to the kind of like waffle models you might make in studio um, in that the horizontals and the verticals have notches that come together and there's a tab that bends down from the verticals um, with a mechanical fastener. So quite simple, um, but um, a lot of prototyping to kind of identify the right amount of tolerance and gaps and things like that um, to make sure it would come together. Um, it came together in two days, which was much quicker than I anticipated. Um, and um, here are some other shots and you get a sense of the kind of variation of the, the, the relief bumps on the outside. So on, on, on the south side, there are more bumps than there are on the north side and so on. Um, some people have, have said it looks like cacti <laughs> um, or trees or, um, uh, which I find funny, especially the cactus reference. Um, this is a detail. Pickles. Pickles. There you go. Thanks, Nick. Um, <laughs> the um, the attachment detail um, is super simple. It's just these hand bent tabs that allow that give a, enough tolerance to to um, to the kind of slightly angled uh, orientation of the horizontals. Um, and again, in a lot of my work, interested in the kind of ornament and the, the effects of kind of computational design on material artifacts, um, you know, in that the, for example, the removal of the tab to fold up creates an aperture below it that creates kind of effects of light and shadow. Um, so always this kind of feedback between the two. Um, and you get a sense of the, the, the staggering of the reinforcement ribs. Um, again, all of this was kind of tested through, through um, prototyping and um, uh, some, some structural analysis as well in collaboration with an engineer. Um, so what I'd, what I'd like to do now is transition um, to some of the more research um, driven work we're doing at CCA um, at the Architectural Ecologies Lab. Um, and this work I think very much is in the same vein of the, the projects I showed, um, both of which are dealing with kind of data and relationship to environment. Um, the Architectural Ecologies Lab was formed in 2018 um, after a number of years um, working on the Buoyant Ecologies project, which I'm gonna talk about today. Um, and I co-direct it with two of my colleagues, Margaret Ikeda and Evan Jones here at CCA. Um, so all of the work I'm showing um, from here on out is is fully collaborative. Um, and um, the, the lab was formed as a way to basically kind of bridge design and science in the context of our school, which is um, a, a, a small kind of arts and design um, school in San Francisco. Um, not necessarily, you know, we don't necessarily have the, the resources of a big university in terms of research labs and things like that engineering departments and so on. And so the, the lab was formed as a way to kind of form partnerships or, or build on existing partnerships that were already in place. Um, so this is just a screenshot from our website. I encourage you to check out, you can see a lot of the student work up there um, as well as our kind of faculty led research projects. Um, our basic um, focus in, in a lot of our work is thinking about material performance at an ecosystemic scale. So I, I like showing this slide um, to, to explain that, on the left is one of our underwater substrate prototypes um, looking at, at how to create habitats for marine animals underwater. And on the right is a speculative drawing thinking about how this might scale up to um, like a kind of floating archipelago of, of, breakwater, of breakwater habitats um, that uh, might perform at a much larger scale, both for um, non-human species who live in the water, but also potentially as a defensive um, barrier for humans that live on the shoreline. Um, and so the work is always, we always try to kind of remind ourselves and push ourselves to think at these two very, very different scales at the same time, to think kind of um, at the scale of the unit, the material, um, and particularly with things that we can make um, and test through physical um, materials, um, but also at the scale of a much larger scale, 
kind of ecosystemic scale. Um, so hopefully you'll see that in, in these projects. I'm gonna show two of our um, recent research collaborations. Um, the first one is a project called Public Sediment for Alameda Creek. Um, this was a year long uh, big collaboration um, that was commissioned as part of um, an initiative here in San Francisco Bay called the Resilient by Design Bay Area Challenge. Um, it was organized by a whole host of local nonprofits with funding from the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and it was a competitive, um, uh, it was a competition in the sense that you had to kind of put together teams and submit to become selected um, for the year long design and research process. Um, we were part of a team led by SCAPE Landscape Architecture, which is a really well-known um, kind of thought, thought leader in, in resilience and, and ecological design uh, based in New York City. Um, and uh, they were the, the, the lead of the public sediment team. And uh, it, the team also included us, the Architectural Ecologies Lab, a group called the Dredge Research Collaborative, which really brought the kind of um, uh, agenda related to sediment, which I'll talk about in a moment, um, to the project. Um, Arcadis, which is a large uh, coastal engineering firm, a uh, team from UC Davis that looked at, um, led a lot of the community engagement efforts um, and outreach efforts, a uh, local landscape firm called TS Studio, um, and a public artist, Cy Keener. Um, and so we worked together for a year, um, basically six months research, six months design, um, and we were one of 10 teams selected for this, this initiative. Um, each team was, was assigned halfway through, assigned a site um, around the San Francisco Bay. So there were 10 different sites around the Bay. Uh, and we worked on a particular tributary called Alameda Creek, um, which is the largest local tributary um, in San Francisco Bay, in the East Bay. Um, the project was, um, uh, like I said, sited on Alameda Creek. This is an aerial view of that. Um, particularly the 12 mile um, section of Lower Alameda Creek, um, which is also referred to as the Alameda Creek Flood Control Channel, um, uh, which runs through a very dense, kind of super dense suburban context um, that looks like this um, before it gets to the San Francisco Bay, which um, through some remaining marshlands um, and, and before it kind of, um, uh, deposits the water into the bay. Um, the project, we, we kind of frame the project ar around three clients, um, sediment, people, and fish. Um, and I think this, this, this came kind of very early on in the process, but really helped us kind of um, frame the, the issues about uh, resilience and sea level rise and vulnerability um, in very important ways, of not just focusing on one of these, but kind of always thinking about these three constituencies. Um, and the project itself, which I'm not gonna go through the whole project, it, it was a, it, basically a kind of large master plan of the lower um, Alameda Creek reach um, and looked at kind of integrating, a lot of the project looked at recalibrating sediment through, flows through the, through the flood control channel, recalibrating water flows um, to make sure more sediment gets out to the, to recharge the wetlands, but also looking at um, fish habitats and migration patterns of steelhead trout um, through up and down the creek. Um, and then also looking a lot at kind of public access, public amenities, um, so, uh, social and economic vulnerabilities in these areas. Um, again, this is this is what that the place looks like. It's it, Alameda Creek is, um, its present form is a flood control channel that was built by the Army Corps of Engineers in the 1950s, 60s. Um, and this is a common story um, across the world, across the country of kind of channelizing natural waterways as a way to prevent um, annual flooding, which was very common in this area. And so there are big levees on either side of it um, that you know, have been very successful in kind of allowing for this, the, these cities of Fremont and Newark and Union City to kind of boom in the last 50 years um, and protecting the property values. Um, so so um, resisting or preventing flooding from happening in this area. The downside is that the channel, the design of the channel, while it works for flood control, it does not work for um, fish habitats. Um, or sediment flows and that much of the sediment coming down from the mountains gets stuck in the channel and has to be dredged annually or every few years 
um, and that that is not making its way to the bay, which is a, a kind of huge, um, uh, very important um, dimension of of building up uh, resilient shorelines in in the in the face of of rising sea levels. Um, really, it's the kind of the primary imperative in San Francisco Bay, as it is in many places, is protecting, rebuilding, restoring wetlands and marshes as a way, as a buffer for storm events and climate events. Um, and in order to do that, you need a kind of healthy flow of sediment through the creek. So a lot of the project, like I mentioned, kind of focused on, on ways to bring um, sediment through this channel while also preserving its flood control capacity. Our role in the project really focused at the material scale um, and on rethinking the kind of edges of the levee. Um, and so we developed this concept, uh, which we call the living levee, as a replacement or a substitute for the typical material condition on these levees, which is just kind of giant boulders and riprap. Um, still kind of recognizing the need for some sort of armoring um, and working with the flood control district, which has jurisdiction over this, this waterway um, and has responsibility for preventing floods. Um, to develop a, let's say, a more intelligent version of riprap that might accommodate more ecological diversity um, than the kind of barren zone of the, of the, rip, of the existing riprap. So we developed these, these modular um, designs for these concrete, um, um, these large concrete tiling systems um, that, again, are, are still kind of an armored and, and solid material but could have perforations or apertures in them to allow for certain species at different scales to grow in a controlled way. This was something that was really important to the flood control district to, um, to have kind of control over which vegetation could grow. Um, and then might allow for, um, as, it, as it gets down to the creek edge, like um, creating cover or little nooks um, that would protect migrating fish as they're moving up and down um, the creek from the, the predator, the birds above. Um, and so we worked, um, these are just some, some small prototypes, but we worked with, with um, thinking a, a little bit about simulation and the water um, and also how um, the modules could change in terms of the aperture and geometry to allow for different types of habitation, including people, which right now the, the, the flood control channel, it's illegal for people to enter it. Um, and so this was a really big, important part of the project is like, how could, how could we uh, maximize public access in a safe way um, into, into the channel itself, which, which even though it's, it's somewhat barren right now, ecologically, it's actually quite a, an amazing site because it's almost hidden. You know, a lot of people in the neighborhoods don't even realize that they live right up against a creek um, because the levee's there. Um, so the Dredge Research Collaborative um, did a bunch of work uh, with, with water table simulations and kind of thinking about how these new structures might impact sediment flows um, at a much larger scale. Um, and the, the kind of final proposal, um, which again is a much larger master plan, but, but explored through a series of these kind of scenario cross sections, um, you, you start to see the living levee modules um, deployed in different ways. Um, at different heights, um, and, and this is the kind of proposed redesign of the flood control channel with a, with a low flow channel in the middle to allow for enough water and sediment to, to regularly flow through the creek um, at all seasons. Um, but you start to see the modules, you know, as kind of bleachers for people um, bringing um, these kind of plateaus out into the channel as, as spaces for communal space for humans. Um, and looking at how vegetation might start to um, be deployed and, and, and occupy the space as well in a more um, diverse way. So thinking about biodiversity as well. Um, and again, these are just some of the kind of speculative images from, from the final presentation. Um, this pro the, the public sediment project, um, which was designed in 2018, uh, was happening uh, just about the same time as we were at the lab, we were working on um, one of our more recent prototypes of uh, ecological substrates, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, which is called the Boyne Ecologies Float Lab. Um, and so I'm gonna spend the rest of the presentation kind of focused on this project, um, which has a number of tentacles and kind of 
side projects that have emerged from it. But just to give a little context, um, I always like to show this slide because um, it's a there's a huge kind of number of people who've been involved in this project, um, including not just uh, myself, and Mar Margaret and Evan, but um, ecologists from Moss Landing, Marine Labs, uh, fabrication experts from Chrysler and Associates, who's a composites manufacturer here in California, naval architects, um, a number of regulatory agencies, and then many, many, many students at CCA who've, who've worked, whose work has been really critical, um, in, especially in kind of visualizing the potential of the, the project, which I'll speak about. Um, but essentially the project grew out of a, a, a hypo hypothesis um, that we developed with our colleagues at Moss Landing Marine Labs, which is a, a big research laboratory down in Monterey Bay, a few hours south of here. Um, and their work is focused on benthic communities, which is um, the kind of bottom layer of, of the seafloor. Um, and particularly they were interested in how how it might be possible to create upside down benthic communities on the bottom of boats or kind of any, any coastal structure um, because these communities happen anyway. Um, and so they were interested in how, how that might become an opportunity. Um, so the work really focuses on this phenomenon of biofouling, which I'm sure many of you in South Florida are familiar with. Um, any boat or any pier or anything in saltwater environments, if left long enough, will look like this. Um, and typically, if, for boat owners, this is seen as a nuisance. This, when boats get fouled uh, with marine organisms like barnacles and um, other invertebrates, um, in that the, it slows down the boat um, and uh, you know has to be. You have to pay somebody to scrape it off every year, basically. Um, and so what we were interested in was actually thinking about this as an opportunity. Like, might there be a way to optimize or, um, or condition surfaces so that um, for structures that don't need to move at high speeds, like, like sailboats and, and power boats, um, might there be a way where there, there's uh, kind of an ecological benefit um, to provide diverse habitats uh, for marine species? And so we developed this hypothesis of the optimized upside down benthos, which this diagram speaks about the kind of typical boat bottom, like the images I just showed, um, you know, is, is often colonized by whatever is the most dominant species, typically in most cases an invasive species um, in that particular site or context. Um, and the idea was, through through geometry um, and creating different sizes of peaks and valleys and nooks and crannies, could you start to create different uh, spaces for different sizes of animals? So at first, just thinking about size um, and then extrapolating from that, like might size relate to different species um, and and thinking about what the ecologists call fish apartments or fish condos. Um, that where the smaller animals would be protected from larger predators that basically couldn't get in there. Um, so it's very similar to how coral reefs work. Um, so essentially kind of an upside down floating coral reef idea. Um, the, other, the other important part of the hypothesis um, was that through, if, if these were successful in kind of building up mass, um, biomass in terms of animals that are attached to them, um, might they also develop a capacity to, to attenuate waves um, and therefore potentially reduce erosion on the shoreline and help you know, become a tool to help with, with climate events and sea level rise. Um, and so in 2014, we began this at, again, as I mentioned, purely as a hypothesis. These are some snapshots of um, student uh, drawings from the Point Ecology Studios over the years. Um, we looked at floating buildings, floating structures in different sites in San Francisco Bay, in Oakland. Margaret and Evan have also taught a number of studios looking at similar ideas in Maldives, which is an island nation in the Indian Ocean, dealing with climate change um, and, and sea level rise in very kind of um, uh, intimate way in that they're facing extreme land loss already. Um, and um, I show this, I think it's important to show this um, because the work, none of the prototyping or kind of um, fundraising or regulatory approval or any of the work that we've been able to do 
would have been possible without the ability for the architecture students to kind of visualize these ideas. Um, and the ecologists that we work with talk often about how, um, you know, especially in these early studios, um, the students' ability to just draw, especially like what they might think it look, looks like underwater, actually inspired the ecologists to think about their own discipline, their own um, area of expertise in a new way. Um, and I think for me, you know, we say that a lot in architecture school, like the power of speculation. Um, but I think, I think this is real evidence of that, that um, these buildings, you know, which at first might seem fantastical, um, the students were actually kind of thinking through, you know, you see that on the underside, kind of different types of geometries um, and how, how that might become materialized and panelized in different ways. And, and, and so I think it's really important, especially for the students here, to know um, that, that your work can have, um, can have like significant impact in that way. Um, the, um, the material focus um, that we began with in this project was focused on uh, fiber reinforced polymer composites, FRP, um, sometimes called fiberglass. Um, and this was largely with our partnership with Chrysler and Associates. Um, FRP is, is, is made by hand, typically laid up um, glass fibers and, and resin on a CNC routed or robotically carved molds. Um, and so the ability to customize geometry is like, it's very easy to do with this material. It's also fairly corrosion resistant compared to steel or concrete um, and extremely lightweight, extremely strong, especially when curved. Um, so the, the, the material itself that we work with is about a quarter inch thick. Um, we worked um, in, the, in the beginning phase of the project developing kind of parametric models um, that start to quantify surface area and rugosity, which is essentially the statistics of bumpiness. Um, and so building a lot on the work of the ecologist and like um, pre-existing work related to coral reef analysis and so on of kind of trying to understand the optimal, um, you know, what's fabricatable with the materials we're using, but also um, what's the kind of range of bumpiness that we want to test. Um, and again, we were able to make these kind of early prototypes. These are about 24 inch by 24 inch um, square. Um, and the shapes look very silly um, and kind of cartoon-like, but these came directly from these, you know, kind of workflow we developed with the ecologists is like, you know, pyramids spaced 10 inches apart with, you know, different, three different heights um, and so on. Um, and so developing kind of different typologies um, that then were installed underwater and monitored and photographed over time to kind of understand how um, different animals might attach. Um, these are some more views of that over time. Um, and the, the work got to a point where um, the ecologists, you know, fairly pleased with uh, the ability for surfaces to generate difference in terms of um, settlement of, of animals on the surface. So this is a kind of um, early proof of concept um, comparison of a before and after of the same plate um, that was installed, I think for maybe 12 weeks or so underwater in Monterey Bay. Um, and the, on the right, you see, these are, this was installed upside down. So these are all animals um, because plants cannot grow upside down without light. Um, and even without knowing, you know, which species they are, um, one can already see the gradi gradation just through color of, you know, smaller animals on the peaks and these larger tunicates kind of nestled in the valleys. Um, so that was really exciting for the scientists to kind of understand that there is a, there, there, there could be a relationship between geometry and slope and um, what sorts of animals like to, um, to congregate on different parts of the surface. Um, we also did a number of tests of kind of um, more, more simple materials of these tubes um, to, to, to test deeper structures. They're very interested in this um, ability that I mentioned before of the kind of wave attenuation capacity. And so this is a before and after of this um, big rack of tubes that was flipped upside down and then put underwater just after a few weeks in the Oakland estuary. Um, this is a shot of like in between a couple of the, the tubes and you see the kind of massive growth. The, again, these are all animals um, can, uh, attached to the surface. Um, and so this, this became very exciting to think about the possibility of, of um, what we call a wave attenuating sponge um, that might be able 
to absorb energy, um, wave energy, um, which as, as you all know in South Florida is, is a kind of critical um, uh, dimension of, of building resilient shorelines. Um, so we, we are also throughout this process, of course, looking at other examples, other precedents, the work of SCAPE, who is our collaborator on the other project, has been a huge influence here. Their project in Staten Island, which is now under construction, Living Breakwaters, um, is quite similar in thinking about uh, multi-species habitats, um, building up a kind of reef structure um, that can attenuate wave action. Um, our work is, is, you know, if you think about theirs as a kind of reef on the ground, ours is a kind of floating, much smaller floating version of that. Um, but also, um, we learned early on that Buckminster Fuller had actually patented two designs for floating breakwaters in the 70s. These were never prototyped, to my knowledge. Um, but uh, our ecologists actually speculate they wouldn't have worked because he didn't seem to have taken into account that they would become fouled. And so these were like these were some sort of fabric structures um, that that um, may have, may become compromised through the fouling. And so um, I thought that was interesting, kind of um, that the in our in our project the fouling becomes the kind of premise or the, the vehicle for the wave attenuation itself. Um, so we began to to conceptualize a kind of larger prototype. Um, this was a very early sketch um, as we started uh, to think about you know how could this scale up. Um, to test the substrates at a larger scale, but also to start to speak to kind of human and habitation in a in a in in some way that the the small plates could not. And th this was done while the students were thinking about larger buildings. Um, and this became the the premise for the 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 float lab prototype, um, which is now floating in the bay. Um, and the design process again was kind of conducted entirely parametrically testing. A design space of uh, that that incorporated like fabrication constraints, size constraints based on transportation, um, material properties of like how curvy we could get with the molds that we were fabricating, um, and then the ecological um, ideas about testing gradients and different different depths of surface bumps and so on over over a larger extent. Um, so the 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 final prototype is this kind of bean shaped or heart shaped in plan. Um, and the, the algorithms we developed basically kind of look at surface area and bumpiness at different scales. So, so the, the, the project has these kind of two large bumps, one smaller than the other. Um, and then mapped onto that is a, is a much finer grain rugosity that then is gradated from one side to the other across the, the prototype. And so the, the scientists were interested in testing gradients at different scales. Um, then which I'll show in a moment, we also had to incorporate kind of all the logistical things of how you actually make something that can float in salt water. Um, and the project was built in 20, 2018, 2017, 2018. Um, it was exhibited at CCA for um, in, our, in our outdoor exhibition area um, as part of a big show there. Um, and it's funny to look at these because it was still so clean and white. Um, it's about the size of a car. So it's 14 feet by nine feet. Um, and the design of it, it, it has a top and a bottom that are identical. So it's like a clamshell, two parts that are fabricated out of fiberglass that are here together. Um, and so the geometry is the same on the top and bottom, but we were thinking about, you know, how the bottom side could, um, react to flows underwater. Um, but also how the top side, which is something we had not tested might also become a kind of floating, you know, intertidal habitat of sorts. Um, we only made one because we that was the funding we had available, um, but we wanted to design into it the kind of behavior, the possibility for multiples. And so these drawings speak to that, the, its ability to tile and expand at a larger scale. Again, as I mentioned before, like always trying to think about, you know, a cluster of three um, or a larger cluster and even potentially, you know, uh, dozens of these um, over across the shoreline. Um, we, we did work on some um, kind of very simple simulations of looking at water flow and how the water might flow across the surface on the underside based on the current, um, but also how water might flow down on the top and the, how these things might start to pool up and create these, these kind of intertidal pools. Um, and the fabrication itself um, was very similar to the smaller prototypes we did 
With one exception, we worked with Chrysler to actually fabricate a reusable mold um, that was used to cast the two parts. Um, and this was done, again, related to this idea of, of producing multiples, of kind of building into the prototype a capacity for expansion and, and, and mass production in a way. Um, also as a little bit of a, of a kind of reflection on FRP fabrication, which can sometimes be very waste intensive in, in creating these kind of EPS foam molds that get disposed of afterwards. And so we, we, we wanted to create a reusable mold, um, which we actually still have. So um, th the thinking was like, maybe we could, we could make more of these um, in the future. Um, and um, the, uh, these are just some photos of the fabrication, um, translation from the digital model. Chrysler um, has a CNC router that's like 60 feet long by 30 feet wide. Um, so they can carve these giant uh, forms um, and then the, the, the shells are laid up by hand. Um, the cross section through the float lab, um, it shows uh, kind of what's happening inside. It's basically, I like to describe it as a sailboat a very strange, strangely shaped sailboat without a mast. Um, it's it's hollow on the inside. There's ballast um, to, to to keep it properly buoyant. Um, there, you know, it's 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 like any boat. There's some pumps. There's a solar panel on the power of the pumps. Um, and we actually did design in a, a kind of irrigation system, which um, worked pretty well at the beginning. But we realized we we didn't need it because plenty of water was getting up there um, without it. Um, and then the underside has a number of hooks that we've been using to connect um, additional prototypes of the substrates. And that's become the kind of one of the primary uses of the float lab. Um, and then, you know, figuring out um, if there are any boat boaters in the audience, you'll be familiar with a lot of this. Figuring out how to, how to integrate hatches, buoy lights and cleats and things like that. Um, pump outflows, um, bilge pump outflows and so on. Um, and so this became, you know, a kind of fun side project uh, of um, all of a sudden we were, we were building a boat. Um, I always like to show this slide. In many ways, these documents maybe are the, um, the most significant accomplishment of the project so far. Um, these are the two permits that we received from the State uh, Bay Conservation and Development Commission, which regulates San Francisco Bay and the federal um, Army, US Army Corps of Engineers, which has jurisdiction over the site where the float lab is deployed right now. Um, this took over a year um, to go through this process. It was really um, enlightening, I think. And, and my partner, Margaret, really takes the credit for shepherding us through. Um, but what was interesting is that the regulatory agencies were both extremely supportive of this work. Um, but what became apparent, and I think a lot of folks are dealing with this who are working in this area, is that there, there's, there's no precedent for this kind of work. Um, and so, so the language and like, you know, a big conversation with the Army Corps was like, what do we call this thing, right? It's not a boat, because if it's a boat, it has to be DMV, um, has to need a DMV permit, because it doesn't have an engine. Um, it's not a buoy. It's not a dock. Um, et cetera. And so I think the term that finally was kind of agreed upon was a floating research platform. Um, and, you know, this is not a large project. Like I said, it's like the size of a car, but it still um, kind of generated a lot of conversation and, and um, kind of revealed to us the importance of like pushing through these types of prototyping and experimental initiatives, because the agencies, you know, like I said, have been very supportive, but they they themselves have to uh, are in the process of kind of rethinking their own role in the in the wake in the in the face of climate change and sea level rise, um, and so the BCDC, which you know was formed in the 1970s, basically to prevent filling of the bay to save the bay from being filled by development. You know now is starting to rethink that in a very important way to think about. You know well, we actually do need to reinforce and and restore wetlands with sediment and think about. Um, Think about uh, measures that can that can help prevent wave action from destroying the, the shoreline. 
Um, and so I think our project, as small as it is, is one way of thinking about maybe an alternative to things like giant seawalls, um, expensive concrete, um, carbon intensive measures um, in a more kind of agile, flexible way. Um, and so I can give a whole kind of side lecture on that part of the project, but um, but the we did get the permits <laughs> and uh, we work, we've worked very closely with the Port of Oakland who's been a really important sponsor of this project um, in that they've given us the site um, to deploy it. Um, this is the, the Bay Bridge connecting Oakland and San Francisco. Um, the Port of Oakland is a huge um, kind of maritime agency that controls all of the shipping cranes and, and ports along the Oakland shoreline. Um, and there's this amazing kind of area of the port called Middle Harbor, um, which itself is a kind of prototype for wetland restoration that led by the port. Um, and it, it became a really great alignment in their efforts to, to, to build a park here. It's called Middle Harbor Shoreline Park, um, restore these wetlands. Um, and to think about the float lab as a kind of demonstration project um, that could align with their, their initiatives there. Um, so the site is at the edge of Middle Harbor, right adjacent to the, the estuary. Um, the flow lab was, was launched in um, fall 2019 um, by the port because they have the capabilities to do, to do um, <laughs> cranes and things like that. This was very easy for them to do, I think, relative to what they usually work with. Um, and it was launched, towed into place um, where, it's, where it remains today um, with a great view of San Francisco and the Bay Bridge. Um, and um, as this kind of floating island, it, it's more moored uh, at four points. Um, and here's just some video clips to get a sense of the scale and kind of context. This was actually right after we installed it in 2019 and a big wake came in from a ferry that came by. Um, so we were nervous, but happy to see that it took the wake very well. Um, and, um, you know, over time um, it's developed, um, this is a more recent video. Um, it's developed a kind of patina of algae and bird waste and all sorts of animal carcasses from the birds hunting on it. Um, and you can see that here. This is kind of above and below. And we've been documenting with photography. It's hard to photograph because the water's not always so clear in the bay because it's very high current in this site. Um, but starting to see you know, that the bottom very soon became totally covered with animals which is great. Um, and here's a, a video of um, an underwater capture, just to get a sense. So this is, I think the big mound, and then that's the little mound. And, you know, a lot of tunicates, which are, which are a, uh, a kind of dominant um, invasive species, but all, but within them in the different pockets, there are many other um, critters having fun down there as well. Um, and so what have we been doing with the float lab, you know, since it's been installed? Um, a big focus has been developing what we call these ecological habitat columns. These are some early ones that were printed um, out of calcium carbonate by our colleague, Alex Schofield. Um, and installed hanging under, under the float lab. Um, this is kind of the before picture. This is after about eight, 12 weeks. Um, and so we're very interested in kind of um, it, testing a range of materials that kind of get us beyond like um, petroleum based materials like resins and so on. Um, and so we've worked with a number of 3D printing prototypes, um, including Alex's here. Um, a few captures um, of, a, of a time lapse that we set up on the float lab to kind of understand what happens when we're not there. Um, the birds love it. Um, and again, you can see them feeding and eating all sorts of fish and we often find bones and stuff on, on top of it. Um, no signs of seals or anything yet, but, um, uh, and then, you know, over time, the top has become this kind of disgusting <laughs> uh, landscape of, of bird poop and algae and barnacles on the on the edge of the float lab, and even in the summer months when there's no rain, um, kind of harvesting salt from the water that that washes a, a board, um, and and which has been really fascinating for us. I love seeing these kind of encrusted um, images of the float lab. 
Um, and just to kind of end, to talk a little bit about some of the, the projects that have come out of this research, um, we're, we're also working with um, the Presidio of San Francisco, which is a big national park in the city, um, right near the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, and they've been working on a lot of marsh restoration projects. They brought, they invited us in um, to develop, to kind of test some of these materials, not in a floating context, but as a kind of liner um, for a, a culvert that was recently constructed um, at Chrissy Marsh. So these are some construction pictures of the kind of concrete wall. Um, it was designed with these rails uh, for the, these FRP composite panels to be attached to. This is what it looks like now, of course, the rendering, you know, is this like beautiful, um, uh, you know, as if you could see it um, when the water's low. The reality is the water is this high; it's like up to here, so you can't actually see them unless you dive, like like our um, colleague John is doing here. Um, but but th these are focused specifically on oyster cultivation, which is the this marsh is great for that because it's more brackish, and there are fewer other invertebrates that um, that. Um, can live in the, in the freshwater mix. And so these are all oysters that, that have been um, kind of uh, attracted to these panels. And so th this, this project was installed last year and, and it's been switched out a few times and um, working with scientists at the Presidio to focus on Olympia oysters which, with great success. Um, my colleague Margaret's also been leading a few courses looking at uh, biodegradable prototypes um, and testing a few of these on the float lab. So these are looking at kind of weaving practices um, of willow trees, dogwood branches, and so on. Um, and then I'm leading a class um, this semester with um, my colleague Alex Schofield looking at um, 3D printed ceramics, um, which I think I'm really excited about this um, as, a, as a substrate material as well, ceramics made of mud. Um, clay, which is totally natural, renewable, um, very resilient when fired. Um, and so we've been working with students to create these kind of modules that we hope to deploy um, later this spring on the foot, underneath the float lab. Um, and then lastly, you know, always again, um, thinking about the larger scale implications of the work um, and how it might scale up. This is literally just kind of scaling the float lab section up to a building scale, thinking about um, self-sufficiency um, in terms of building systems, water collection, water reuse, aquaculture, um, so on. A lot of the ideas explored with the students in the studios. Um, and coming back to the idea of, of kind of thinking across scales from the, from the unit, the module to the, the network of, of floating breakwaters. Um, that again, you know, could be one, one more tool in the tool set to think about um, how we might adapt and react and, um, and um, respond to climate change and climate events. Um, so I think I'll stop there. Um, thank you all and look forward to any questions you have and you can follow us um, at all these channels, um, websites, if you like. That was great, Adam. So much, Adam. This was uh, wonderful uh, to see um, the, the theory, practice, and politics of uh, thinking about future of resilient cities. And not only, um, in a sense, we have to rethink some of the existing typologies, but look for new prototypologies. So that document and kind of this rethinking what we even call our new typologies and scales is really fascinating. So I'm going to. Um, pass the um, platform to uh, our students that have a few questions lined up and then we'll continue with uh, questions in chat and the uh, rest of the audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Marcus, for such an insightful presentation. Now my peers and I will start the discussion and then we'll open up to the public. I'll celeb I personally celebrate the focus on producing work that's filled with purpose, logic, and arguments, um, which serve as the conducting thread that weaves each stage of, of the design process. And we can actually see that um, throughout your presentation, which is something that as architecture students, we strive for. Um, so in that sense, my question would be, if when presented to these uh, challenges, you have already established a modus operandi on how to approach the research stage of the project. Do you start with gathering data 
or the approach leans more on first researching the historical and cultural background, or maybe you approach each challenge differently because they are so um, wide in the variety that um, you have shown, not only in, in your presentation, but also in your uh, website. Um, so um, I guess my question is, how do you get to that aha moment, that first seed that allows for the development of everything else? That's a great question. Um, do you guys want me to stop sharing? Is that better for the, for the group? As you wish. Yeah, I'll stop. Um, yeah, I mean, so it's a great question. With the Buoyant Ecologies Project, I, I feel like the, the process maybe is reverse of what one might um, pursue through like a con conventional research project in that we did not start with data. Um, we started with a speculation, <laughs> like a hypothesis, um, which I, I guess is fairly common as well. But, um, but specifically we started with, with design studios in which students were, were um, really like speculating about what these floating structures might look like. Um, uh, and again, with very few precedents um, in this kind of work, um, we like to talk about the approach, the approach we take with these studios is what I often call informed speculation, which is a fancy way of saying kind of educated guess, guessing. Um, and I think architects and architecture students have unique capacities for, for thinking that way and that um, we, can, we can put forward a kind of what if statement um, or a hypothesis, but we can also draw it and, and visualize it. And I think that that can be a really useful uh, vehicle for catalyzing a research agenda. Um, and a lot of times we think about the kind of drawings and documentation comes at the end, um, which certainly does. Um, but in, the, in this project, one of the big things I learned was that like you can actually start a research agenda in that, in that mode. Um, so um, I mentioned that during the talk. I think with some of the other projects, I often like in, in the practice work, I, we do often kind of like scour for data sets um, as a way um, to start thinking about um, information that's available or collectible in some way um, and what, what you can tangibly do with that. Um, so I don't think there's necessarily kind of one prescribed route, um, but I think, um, uh, I think in both cases, whether you start with the data set or, or start with a kind of speculative idea, I think the question of representation and, and um, how to visualize things, how to, how to communicate things is key. Thank you. Um, hi, um, I also wanna congratulate you on your work. Uh, very, very uh, informative to see this type of research. Um, Anna and I are actually partners in studio and we are actually looking at something more or less around the same that um, a, a, a tile that will um, not uh, be more permanent to the site and therefore grow uh, when the sea level, uh, sea level rise um, happens to cover the site um, and create this new life. Um, but I wanted to ask you, do you think that if you would have used a different materiality or even um, it being less stationary, would that have an effect on the life that was grown, um, I guess, in the structure of, the, of your project? That's a good question. So the material, th that question comes up a lot, just about like, you know, are there alternatives to, to FRP? Um, which the answer is definitely yes. I mean, in our case, really our options at the time were FRP or I suppose concrete. Um, and, you know, there are lots of examples of like floating concrete barges and so on. Um, and um, we, we were working with, you know, a partner who, who um, has been like extremely supportive and generous uh, with their material donations and time. Um, so that kind of made a lot of decisions for us, but also, like I mentioned, the kind of lightness of, of FRP was really important. 
Um, and Chrysler would, would, would make the argument that um, even though it's petroleum-based material, the kind of lightness and strength of it um, perhaps has a as um, you, you know, is less carbon intensive than the kind of massive quantities of concrete that would be needed. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know, you know, um, where to fall on that spectrum, but I think in terms of the ecological performance as it relates to material, because I think that's what you, you were asking about, um, the, you know, we're, we're still very much testing different materials and composites through these smaller columns. Um, the ecologists are a little bit kind of agnostic about like materiality. Um, they're, they're, the folks that we're working with are much more focused on geometry um, and, and the kind of spatial dimensionality, um, which is not to say that you know, certain materials perform better or worse, because I think there's been a lot of research by others in, into that. Um, and, um, but, but I think, you know, for, for them, for the folks that we work with, the FRP, you know, it could be FRP, it could be, you know, um, concrete, it could be steel. Um, for them, it's less about the actual material composite and it's more about the kind of shape and the geometry. Um, so I, I personally, I, what I'm very interested in is the like biomaterial um, possibilities here or the ceramics and so on, um, something that's less carbon intensive. Um, and uh, potentially degradable. Like I'm very interested in the, the kind of um, th rethinking the kind of permanent um, uh, assumptions of things like seawalls and things like that. Like could, the, could, could these structures start to change over time? So that's the second part of your question was about the stationary um, aspect. And the float lab, it has been stationary. I mean, it hasn't moved in a couple of years now. Um, but the idea behind it is that, you know, if floating breakwaters were, were to be a kind of viable um, uh, tool uh, for thinking about protecting shorelines, that their, their movability and portability um, would be a huge advantage because um, if you compare it to like a seawall or a jetty, right, which can't be moved. Um, and, and so I think that there's a, there's a great amount of potential there. Um, and, um, and it's cool that you're, you, you guys seem to be thinking about it. Thank you. Hey, Adam, hey, this Nick. is Nick. How are you, man? Good to see you. That was you, you too. <clears throat> I'm, I, I, I'm asking a question just because, uh, I always enjoy speaking with you and I miss you, man. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah. Be beautiful work. I uh, just want to commend you and say um, uh, initially, you know, I think there's a really interesting conversation here, you know, where we typically associate, you know, uh, ecology with urbanism. And we're all somewhat familiar with ecological urbanism. Um, and I, I think what you have really uh, excelled at, if you think about urbanism, it isn't sort of a larger scale aggregation of details. Urbanism is kind of aside from tectonics, uh, in a way. Um, and so, uh, I, I was going to suggest, I was going to ask, like, have you given thought to this as a new kind of category? And then I looked back at your poster and saw that it was called ecological tectonics. <laughs> and I think, you, I think you nailed it on that. Okay. So, but, um, uh, I, I wanted to ask a question. Are, are you familiar with the Robin Evans essay translations from mm -hmm. building to drawing? There's a great part in that essay where he talks about teaching in an art school and assuming that artists and architects would approach drawing uh, in a very similar way. Um, and, 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 and he talks about how he was struck and actually surprised by how, um, you know, artists really, they, they don't spend a lot of time like doing sketches of what the final artifact is going to be. They just dive right in and work on the final artifact. Whereas architects invest a lot of time, really all of their time in the representation of the thing and not the thing itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I was thinking in terms of your work and in terms of data visualization, it's interesting that um, in a way, I, I'm curious about drawing here, like, and, and I think you have just beautiful graphics. Uh, you know, I think w we have colleagues interested in ecology who, uh, who uh, you know, have interesting graphic uh, styles to say the least, but I, I love your graphics, want to commend them. And I just, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it and curious what you think. It, it's almost as if the prototype 
that you end up with in a way is a kind of representation of, of the drawings or, or, or if we can call data drawings, uh, kind of third category of that relationship. And it was just something that I thought about while you were speaking and, you know, curious if you have any thoughts about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's thanks, Nick. Um, I haven't thought a lot about that in relationship to like the float lab work. Um, but I have thought, I mean, the Minneapolis project for me is a drawing project, the both, both of those projects, the, the facade projects. And, um, you know, I didn't talk about it today, but I've, for a number of years, I've been working with my old colleague, Andrew Cudless on a traveling show called Drawing Codes, which was in my, it was at the University of Miami just before the pandemic in 2019. Um, and so, um, uh, and we're now working on a kind of book documentation of that. So like definitely the, the drawing, the representation and drawing has been a huge part of, of my own work and um, both in, in my own practice, I, I work a lot with just kind of 2D parametric systems as a way to kind of um, think through design ideas um, in, a, in a diagrammatic way. And I often use that um, as in my courses with students. I teach a lot of the core um, computation fabrication courses here at CCA and um, try to introduce things like Grasshopper in, in that way, like not jumping to the kind of panelized surface um, approach, but thinking more about like two dimensional drawings. Um, and so I, I like, I appreciate the comment a lot. I think in the, in the Minneapolis projects, it was, um, it was, a, I mean, our deliverable was a drawing, like, like, or the, I guess the individual drawings for each piece of glass. But um, I think what, what was difficult and challenging and fun in that project was the scale um, in that it was so big that there was no way to proto to like, to prototype it um, for real. I mean, I think a lot of architectures obviously like this. Um, so we did lots of full scale prints and kind of tests on site and things like that, but nothing, you know, at the scale of, you know, of seeing it realized um, across 600 feet of glass. Um, and so I think like that, for me, even though it is like the project itself is a kind of drawing on a building, let's say, um, that scale jump of like working, so developing on a screen forever um, over three or four years um, and then kind of seeing it and, and, you know, through small prototypes, kind of understanding what scale it is. Um, but then that kind of jump when, when it becomes fabricated and installed still was like quite dramatic in a way um, with, good, with, you know, lots of good surprises, I think. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I've, I've been thinking a lot about the drawing, um, like how that thinking about drawing might relate maybe more directly to some of the ecological work. And I don't really have any like concrete thoughts on this yet, but I've been, you know, I, I look a lot to the work of people like Donna Kukova at Carnegie Mellon, who, who's worked with her students doing amazing kind of drawings of ecological systems. Um, and so thinking, you know, how, how could these like, parts of the practice be synthesized more, but yeah, it's a great comment. Hi, Adam. Uh, hey. I wanted to uh, once again, congratulate you on your impressive projects. And I was actually very curious on um, the involvement of the students in these uh, different projects, because a lot of us are taught um, to kind of design on land for land animals. Um, but could you kind of elaborate some of the maybe problems or breakthroughs that you had from the paradigm shift of designing for uh, sea animals on sea? Yeah, um, that's a great question. I think, you know, we, we started, th those studios were focused on marine invertebrates um, upside down. Um, and you know, we definitely took all of our, like uh, the, the, uh, the marine ecologists we work with are amazing in terms of their knowledge and kind of expertise in this. Um, 
And so everything I know, I learned from them um, at the Benthic Lab at Moss Landing. Um, I think maybe I had two thoughts on it. One, like more about the research process and one like more conceptual. Um, with the Voine Ecology's work, what was really interesting um, in terms of process is that, you know, often I would, I would try to prompt the ecologist for, you know, like, how can, like, let's try to be as quantitative as possible and like, you know, really try to understand, like, you know, literally how slope and dimension can relate to patterns of settlement on a surface. Um, and this is again, like the way my brain works, like trying to like get everything in a perfect model basically, right? Um, and optimize for it. Um, and it, it was funny cause like the, the ecologists we work with have, are, are, you know, I've been doing this for many, many years. Um, and for them, and, and this is very common in, in the biological sciences, um, though the process is much more um, experience-based, like almost anecdotal, you know, and they kind of like say, oh yeah, that type of surface will do that or that type of surface will do that. And so it was, it was this funny in the early days, a funny kind of like, I had different expectations um, about like in terms of a scientific process, let's say. Um, and it's not to say that like thinking based on experience or observation um, is any less rigorous um, because that's, that's, that's how it works. I mean, they basically take the plates out of the water and count, uh, <laughs> literally kind of count per square foot or per square inch um, species. Um, and it, you know, it's just a kind of reflection on the process, I guess, of like um, two different disciplines coming together um, and, and how, you know, different disciplines have totally different ways of thinking about data and, and observation and data collection. Um, so in terms of uh, like thinking about designing with other species, designing for other species, um, that I think, you know, in last, last fall and again in the next coming academic year, I'm gonna uh, teach a, a, an advanced studio, um, which I've been calling materialities of care and in these studios, I've actually been kind of scaling back a little bit from the underwater habitats and asking students to think just more broadly about designing for um, more than human clients um, or kind of thinking about human, non-human cohabitation in a way. Um, and, you know, it's tricky, like, because it can easily get like super silly and weird. Um, but I think it's been really interesting to kind of tease out a little bit more of the conceptual and kind of political and theoretical dimensions of, of um, you know, challenging hierarchies of like human-based design basically. Um, and I think the I found that the students are, um, the students that we're working with are like, like really interested in this. <laughs> and so a lot of this is coming from them. Um, and, um, and you know, maybe I think maybe that's a good sign, kind of generationally, um, to kind of, as one way. I think it's not the only way, but I think one way of of thinking about eco ecology um, is to kind of challenge, you know, the focus on on designing just for humans. Um, I would say the key is that, like, you know, we are not scientists or ecologists or biologists, and so the key is like how to find the right way to incorporate, you know, scientific research. Um, especially in a studio, which is like finite time period. Um, and so, you know, um, it's, it's always a kind of, there are a lot of ways to do it, but, but that can become, um, that's often like the biggest challenge. Um, but I think it's, um, you know, I, I'm going to do the studio again in the fall, so we'll see how it goes. It went really well last fall. Um, but I'm really interested in like how specifically like techniques of digital fabrication can can give us more agency in thinking about these questions. So. Thank you so much. Um, any other questions from the audience? If there isn't, I have one last question, if I may. So, um, you mentioned that one way that um, as architects or as architecture students, we can contribute to interdisciplinary research is in providing uh, representation and kind of future um, future reality representations. 
Um, can you um, elaborate on um, perhaps the role of interdisciplinary research in future of architecture? Um, and I think this is quite uh, becoming more and more common in different schools and disciplines, especially in CCA or even here, we're in a lab that's very much funded by grants that are uh, kind of acquired outside of architecture. So um, if you can kind of project forward and for our students to start to think about what are different types of maybe professions and disciplines that we can engage with. Them. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's, thanks, Bihana. That's a great question. I think, um, I mean, obviously it comes as no surprise, like I'm a strong believer in like expanding expanded discipline, disciplinary thinking. Um, I think architects are like particularly well positioned because even if you're an architect who kind of, you know, is focused, let's say in a more kind of traditional disciplinary focus, you're still always thinking about multiple clients, multiple materials, multiple scales, right? So I think we, we are uniquely um, we have unique expertise in being able to kind of like synthesize different types of information. Um, so, you know, I think um, my, from my own experience, again, like not being at a, at a large research university, um, I think has made in a way like our lab, the work I do with Margaret and Evan um, has forced us to be like extremely entrepreneurial um, and always looking out, um, <laughs> out, out of, out of the college. Um, and, you know, interestingly, now we're starting to form close partnerships with folks in the college related to the ceramics work as well. But, but in terms of the sciences, like always looking out to science and to, to academia and industry from outside the college. Um, so I think like that's become very kind of second nature, um, you know, originally out of necessity, but now it's just a kind of our default way of working that, you know, we're always kind of seeking partnerships. Um, and, you know, people, you, you, you guys know this too, like um, people love working <laughs> with architecture students because um, like I said before, you all can, can make really compelling drawings and visualize things in unique ways. Um, so I think there's a real value there. Um, you know, I think, um, I also just think, like maybe I've just become more, this has become more front and center in my own practice over the past 10 years. But I think the like question of climate change demands collaboration. Like, like that is a, this is a problem that, that needs everybody working <laughs> together um, to, to think about, you know, solutions for adaptation. Um, and it's only through that sort of, those sort of collaborations that, you know, anything, any progress will be made. Um, and so I think for me, it's, it's also become just a kind of recognition of that. And, and, you know, we've had lots of conversations here about, you know, as I'm sure you have in many schools, like, you know, essentially position, trying to think of ways to position the entire curriculum around questions of climate um, in different ways. Um, and perhaps that, you know, if we're not doing that, then maybe that, maybe, maybe we should be. Um, and, and so I think, and again, like I said before, with, with student, with the current generation of students, I think a lot of this interdisciplinary thinking or, or certainly collaborative mindset is um, kind of expected uh, by them. Um, and it comes very naturally um, to them. And so I think, I think all of this is a good thing because I, I'm very much um, am somewhat skeptical of the kind of sole architect, you know, genius architect model. Um, and so I think to, to the maximum extent possible, as much as we can kind of encourage collaboration across within the discipline and across disciplines, um, um, I, think, I think it'll, it'll be for the betterment of everyone. So, yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much again for your time and sharing your wonderful, wonderful projects. Hope we uh, will be able to host you in Miami um, in the near future. 
and perhaps find ways to collaborate as um, you know, working in coastal city, but also future of resilient cities are requiring a lot of also knowledge share between institutions. Thank you Absolutely. so much. Absolutely. I mean, I like, you know, obviously it's fun. It'd be fun to visit Miami, but I think South Florida is uh, like, you know, these questions are front and center for you guys, even more so, much more so than in the Bay. So I was joking with Biana before the call, like, let's, let's do another float lab in Miami. <laughs> thank you Biana. it's yeah. great to be here thank you have a great one thanks everyone <laughs>